The Penn Museum's many excavations have uncovered details of civilizations across the world. Many of these were patriarchal societies, in which women's access to political and religious leadership was limited. In the ancient city of Ur, however, we have discovered stories of several important women who were rulers and religious leaders. Well, there were certainly powerful women at Ur, but I think it's important for us to also acknowledge the fact that there was importance of all women in the ancient Near East. They were not just the people who took care of the home and the children, although that was an important part of what women did, but they were also involved in the industrial life and crafting, and uh, particularly in the textile industry. They were involved in um, mercantilism as well, so we have a list of women at Sippar uh, who were merchants. And we also know that women were scribes, so they weren't as common in these positions as men were. It was a patriarchal society, and we don't have as much information about women as we would like to have, but we do know that they played important roles. There were certain positions, um, and I know the most about the city of Ur, so we're talking about them mostly, uh, that were female and that were very high-powered. We have the name of Puabi, and she was a queen, so she was wearing a cylinder seal that listed her name and title. So it's Puabi Eresh, Puabi the Queen. She, we date her grave at least to around 2450 BCE. She may have ruled slightly before that, and the cylinder seal does not mention a king, her husband, which may mean that she ruled in her own right. We, normally, queen cylinder seals do say, queen so-and-so, wife of so-and-so the king. But hers just says Puabi Queen, and that may mean that like Hatshepsut in Egypt or Elizabeth I in England or something like that, she ruled on her own. We can't prove it, but it sure sounds like it. Puabi was dressed very elaborately with a headdress and a beaded cloak. The headdress had multiple parts. At the very top, we find a comb, kind of like a Spanish comb, uh, that's decorated with star-like rosettes, that's in gold, and it had a pin on it that stuck down into her wig or into her hair. She also wore wreaths around her head, and her hairline was a wreath that was made out of flowers, uh, lapis lazuli and agate, blue and white, which is a wonderful contrast, as well as gold. And then below that were wreaths of leaves, local leaves to ore, poplar leaves and willow leaves. Under the wreaths were um, her, her hair was wrapped in gold ribbons. One of the ribbons was over 30 feet long. She also had hair rings. Her hair probably was pulled through rings. They're, they're on the side of her head and very large lunate earrings. Interestingly, the earrings, which are very large, were probably not that heavy. And they either were stuck through her ears, um, she may have had pierced ears, or they may have actually hung over the ear as well. Below her neck, she wore several necklaces very well crafted, again with the same combination of gold and silver and lapis and carnelian and agate, and uh, several necklaces, and then under the necklaces, uh, an incredible beaded cloak with over 50 strings of beads. And again, you see the same colors, the lapis, the agate, the carnelian, the gold and silver. It all clearly was created to go together. Or was an interesting site. Um, Mesopotamia was interesting in that the soil was rich, there was plenty of water, but there were no natural resources like minerals, um, semi-precious stones. So when we look at Puabi's jewelry, we see a trade network. Uh, the lapis lazuli in antiquity came from only one place, which was Badakhshan, Afghanistan. So we know the lapis was traded from Afghanistan. The carnelian and the agate probably came from um, perhaps the Iranian plateau. Uh, gold and silver, again, none of, the th none of these uh, things were available locally. The gold and silver would have come from the Iranian plateau, perhaps Afghanistan as well. Another title is Intu, and that is the priestess, the high priestess we tend to uh, translate it as. This was the woman who looked after the ritual, the cult of the primary deities. 
So at Ur, the most important god was Nana, the moon god, and the Intu was the high priestess of Nana. But she also looked after the rituals for his wife consort, who was Ningal, the chief goddess of the city. And so the high priestess was the earthly representation and therefore held a great deal of power. She was also, I think in almost every case we can definitely know who held that position, it was the daughter of the king, so she was also part of the royal family. The first Intu priestess we can really name is Inhe Duwana. She was the daughter of the Akkadian king Sargon around 2300 BCE. And then we know Inanatuma, who was the daughter of the Isin king Ishmi Dagon, and he, uh, well, she was in the position around 1900 BCE. And then if we jump even farther forward, we have the name Inigaldi Nana, who was the daughter of the Babylonian king Nabonidus around 550 BCE. In Heduana, we have her name in a number of places. So they found a cylinder seal of one of her servants, basically someone who mentions the fact that they worked for In Heduana on the cylinder seal. So that's one way we know that she was important. Another is the disk of Enhe Duwana. I don't know what else to call it, really. It's sometimes called a lunar disk, possibly made to mimic the full moon, because it's a circle, it's stone. It was found broken in the Gipuru in a much later level than when Enhe Duwana lived. So it was revered for a very long time and kept in that temple of Ningal, or very near there. She also wrote hymns and gathered a bunch of hymns to the goddess Inanna. Those hymns were still being copied down and used in ritual a thousand years later, and the people still knew her name because she actually signed the works. It was unusual for any scribe writer, any person in the ancient world, certainly in ancient Mesopotamia this early, to put their name down on a work. So she's the only, well, the earliest one we know that actually records her name with what she wrote. It makes her the first named author in history. I think that's really impressive.